Fab, thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you for such a warm, a warm welcome. And I'm delighted to be here. ISEGS, 25 years. Um, you could see the contribution ISEGS has made to the career development sector from space. It's that big. It's, it's, it's an enormous contribution. And the impact, absolutely worldwide. I'll, I'll endorse what's been said before, and I could talk at great length about that, but that's not what I'm here to do. So I'll crack on. Um, although I would say, such a, a, a fantastic institution and, and uh, an important celebration. It's, it, it, I think it went to my head when I was invited to do this talk. I, th I think I got a bit carried away and came up with a very grandiose title and, and went really big picture with it. So, so I'm going to have to justify such a grandiose topic to you and I'll, and I'll do my best to do that. Um, so let me, uh, where's my buttons, there we are. Okay, oh, no, we're going too far now, what's going on? Um, so this is the journey I'm going to take you on. Um, ISEGS is all about theory, practice and policy, so that was kind of my brief. So I'm going to take you through, first couple of sections are going to be more theory-ish, middle bits, more practice-y, and towards the end, the last couple of sections are going to be more about policy, and, and I'm perhaps going to pose a question uh, or two to, to you and give you something to go away and think about. Um, and, and when you see the number six on the screen, you know the end is close. <laughs> so there is hope. <laughs> so first of all, I want to talk about um, career theory and um, some, of the, some of the problems with it. Um, now, I do actually love career theory. I kind of collect them. I kind of, they, they, there's loads of them now. I kind of put them in my cabinet of curiosities and take them out and have a look at them occasionally. That one's interesting. Put it back. They're, they're wonderful. I love them. I'm a bit of a theory nerd, and I know I'm not the only one in this room. Um, but for ideas to move on, you kind of, it's almost like you have to re react against, kick against what's already there. The, the previous generation of, of thought. So I'm going to present you with a, a critique of career theory. It's not going to, there's no attempt to make it balanced. I'm not going to be giving credit to anybody's ideas either. I, don't, I won't be naming names. I've stolen ideas from lots of people here. Um, so I'm going to give you a critique of career theory and some of the things that, that annoy me about some of the directions it, it takes. Um, but that's not to say that, that it isn't a fabulous thing. So, but some of my pushback, I'm going to give you the next few slides are some of the issues that I think we could be concerned about in career theory. First of all, the starting point for a lot of modern career theory is all the world's changing. It's all gone funny. It's all gone a bit wobbly. Um, and there's a tendency to start theorists who are maybe aren't labor market uh, analysts start from a broad brush statement the labor market's you know changing enormously without really looking at how it changed in the past which was substantially a tendency to focus on what's new discontinuity rather than what's what's stable what's continuous and the devil's in the detail with labor markets. Industries are different, occupations are different, regional differences. So we tend to start in our theorizing from sweeping generalizations about the labor market that are not true for everybody everywhere. And sometimes over generalizing from a small group of workers who are held up as particularly interesting. So that's one thing. Now, it gets a bit worse because it's a small step. Oh, sorry, I should explain. The insert word here, career, is my way of capturing this idea. There's loads of ideas in our space, the something career. I've boundary list, protein, kaleidoscope, blah, add, you know, there's loads of them. Um, that's my way of capturing that idea that in the future we're all going to be doing that. Well, really, all of us? Maybe, not sure. Um, now, it's a small step from there to go from work is, insert, is uncertain, so you must do this. You must be flexible, learn career management skills. In university sector, oh, learn employability 
again, employability attributes, take responsibility. We found a really cool group of workers. They're probably creatives or professionals, and, and everyone's going to be like them, and you should be too. There's a tendency to have that sort of logic. And there's a, it's an ideological step from describing careers to saying how you must live your life or how you should live your life. So we need to be wary of that step of logic because it's not always flagged in the literature when that step's being made. Many people have made the point that career theory, particularly career theory emerging from business schools, has tended to focus on managerial and professional careers. Tendency not to be interested in blue collar jobs. That fabulous, that, that model group of workers, it's never plumbers, is it, or bus drivers. Um, a tendency not to be interested in working class lifestyles. Um, and, and, and obviously in, in, um, uh, in, in these times when we need to be aware of, of decolonizing colon, thinking, there's been a neglect of workers in developing and emerging economies as well. So we've tended to have career theories that, that focus on people who've got lots of choice, lots of potential, um, and we underestimate the, the, the constraints that people face in their lives, or at least some people face. Some of us are just trying to get by. Another thing I've noticed is a focus on narrative. So narrative seems to be the solution, irrespective of what the problem is. Um, a lot of career theories, starting from quite different points, all end up recommending you should use narrative career counseling. I've got nothing against narrative career counseling. Add it to your toolkit. Fabulous. I'm just not sure it's a, a Swiss Army knife solution to every problem, every situation. Some people have pragmatic needs. Some people need a bit of information. Some people need funding. Not everybody needs narrative work. So it's suitable in some circumstances. More generally, we have difficulty reconciling counseling models with career problems. So, uh, some of the more generic counseling theories work pretty well for us, but they're not always well attuned to um, issues that are specific to the career space. And let's take this a, a stage for, further and add a bit to it. Um, I've noticed a bit of a convergence between what career theory says, what comes from counseling, the self-help literature, and a kind of an American notion of how you should get on in the world. And it all seems to, to focus in on self-transformation. Your, your, yourself is the project. Change yourself, and then the world will fall at your feet. It's a ten, there's a tendency for theory to converge on that sort of message. Um, and of course, what if, you, what if you try that and it doesn't work? Well, it's probably your fault then, isn't it? You probably didn't try hard enough, and you should try again. It's a meritocracy, so really go back to basics and, and work a bit harder. So there's a little bit of a cult of self-transformation in the literature. Now, I'm exaggerating a little bit for effect. Actually, a lot, of, a lot of contemporary theories are great ideas. The problem is not so much with the ideas, it's with the overgeneralization and saying it's true for everybody everywhere, or for saying you have to do this. It's the, it's the prescription and the overgeneralization that's the problem rather than the ideas, which in many cases are quite innovative contributions relevant to some people some of the time. So, um, pulling that together, in, in reacting against some of that material, it gives us some ideas of what I'd like to see in a career, career thinking. So, it needs to be a bit abstract so it can apply in lots of situations. And that's what you want in a theory. We have to be theorized in a way that's relevant not just to the middle classes and the wealthy. It's got to be relevant to disadvantaged groups and be a little bit politically aware because some of these ideological steps can be unhelpful. Making people be flexible doesn't, doesn't always help precarious workers. That they're, they're suffering from that flexibility. So just be aware of the abuse of ideas. It would be good to be explicit about our 
worldview and the assumptions we're making about people. I'll say more about that later. But we shouldn't make too many assumptions about what the outcomes should be, what people should become, or what work, uh, what the work they're likely to end up in should be like. And ideally, of course, useful for practitioners rather than just uh, for academic careers. Now, um, I'm going to talk now about a perspective which I think ticks maybe not all of those boxes, but some of those boxes. So, let me introduce to you the capability approach. Actually, to call it a theory is over-egging the cake. It's not really a theory. It's, it's a way of starting your thinking off, really. That's, that's how I see it. It's a way of, of just getting started thinking about an issue, thinking about how to make people's lives a little bit better. It certainly isn't a fully formed theory as such. This um, originates in the work of this chap. Um, so this cheerful looking gentleman is Amartya Sen, and he's a fairly famous economist and philosopher from uh, the Indian subcontinent originally, Bengal, um, although he's lived a lot of his life in UK and America, um, and is a, um, has been very influential, and he's familiar both with economics and Indian uh, Indian Sanskrit literature as well, lots of influences on him. His hobbies include reading, arguing, and cycling, which is kind of relevant to us, especially the arguing thing. This isn't one of those things where you have to sit at the feet of the master and do exactly what he says. It's not one of those. He just gives you a back of an envelope few ideas to take away and do something interesting with in your own domain. Um, so people have taken his ideas in lots of different directions. As part of the justification for the uh, rather pompous title to this, this lecture, um, his book, Development as Freedom, gave me uh, inspiration for the title of this, this lecture, in which he, he talks about the capability approach and links it to his notion of freedom. In a way, he's a, a theorist who's, who's, I guess, um, got his own angle on social justice and what freedom means um, is central to that, central to his arguments. And we'll try and explore that a bit this afternoon. Um, in many ways, although he started off the capability approach, really it's other people who've, who've, who've turned it into a, uh, a small cult, if you like, or a, a, a small um, little project. It's got its own academic journal now. Human Developments and Capabilities, which is multidisciplinary, but probably the, the field in which the capability approach has most been used has been international development, economic development in low-income countries, essentially. But it's been applied in education, in employment, in, in, in a number of areas. And the ideas do translate to supporting people in developed economies, particularly people living in poverty. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a thing. Um, now, I'm going to break this up with a couple of random stories. Um, so here's a story. I, I, I own a bicycle. Um, and um, the, a picture on the right is, is, is a photograph of the canal. near. We're very close to my flat. And um, I... I was cycling on it on it to work quite regularly, um, and um, a couple of years ago, I, I came off my bike, made a bad decision, tried to overtake when I shouldn't have done, and um, I came off my bike and I broke my shoulder blade. Um, it, it took a while to heal, um, but I did what you're supposed to do, which is get back on the bike. So that was two years ago. Now a year ago, round about this time of year, on a frosty morning. I came off my bike again. I don't actually remember what happened, but I came to in an ambulance uh, on the way to hospital where they gave me a brain, brain scan and said, yes, you have a brain, there's nothing wrong with it, go away. Um, I had concussion. Um, but after that, I didn't get back on the bike. 
And the reason was I didn't have the confidence. I was no longer confident that I could do it without risk to hurting myself. So there is a point to this story. There's a key message here about the capability approach. Bike and cycling are not the same thing. Okay. Possessing a resource is not sufficient to guarantee being able to enjoy the lifestyle it might afford. So it turns out you don't just need a bike to cycle. You need the skills of a cyclist. You need the confidence. You need a nice flat surface. You need somebody to put lighting in. For There is lighting on it. Um, you need a bike shop at the end of the canal when something gets broken. There's a whole infrastructure you need. There's some internal things, and there's some things in your environment you need as well in order to be able to convert that resource into a desirable, acti a desirable lifestyle, really. Um, so I promise I'll try and get back on the bike next year, I promise. But uh, so we're beginning to introduce some of the key concepts in the capability approach now. First of those is um, resources. Now, by resources, it's not just tangible things like bikes. It could be intangible things like skills or networks or maybe legal rights, the legal right to work, perhaps, in the UK. That's, an, that's a resource. So tangible and intangible things that you, in some sense, possess. But you also need other things as well that enable you to convert those resources into lifestyles. Okay, so a range of other factors might be necessary to combine in order to deploy a resource successfully. <coughs> then you've got your capability set, which is a central idea, I suppose, that for everybody, there's a range of possible lifestyles they could engage in. There's a, a set of things that they can do, a set of statuses they could be in. So that's the central. And it's the word capability, it's not used in the everyday sense, I should explain, or in the way that HR practitioners use it. It, it, it refers to this set, hopefully for, you, hopefully for you guys, a very wide set of things that you could potentially do. Then choice, well, I think we're comfortable with that as careers advisors as a concept. And then they use the rather strange word, functionings, which is what you end up doing. Sen likes the phrase beings and doings. So um, they're not necessarily the same. For example, Boris Johnson wanted to be prime minister. He didn't want to do the job of prime minister. Um, so being and doing are not necessarily the same concept, but uh, they might over, overlap at times. So let's put all that together into a kind of a picture so we can see how it works. So first of all, you've got your resources, your intangibles and your tangibles. You've got your capability set, the set of things you could be and do. And then there's what you end up being and doing. Now, this is really, when I came, first came across this, I thought this is really isn't much different from how careers people think. You got like, it's what have you got? What strengths have you got? What have you got to start with? What have we got to work with here? What are your options? What's your career, uh, career outcome at the end of it? It's not really not so very different. It's just, I suppose, in slightly more abstract sense. Um, it's, it's pitched in a slightly more high level way, but essentially it's strengths, options, and career outcomes. And then linked by, oh no, sorry, I should say, so another way of putting it is you have, um, the means to accomplish the, oh, what have I done here? Hang on, let me click that away. The freedom to accomplish, so freedom is essential here, and accomplishment, okay? Um, and we've got those linking concepts of conversion factors, things you, set of things you might need, a, a number of things you might need to deploy your resources and then the choices that you make. Um, now that's great, but the capability approach, approach is not a career theory. It wasn't, it doesn't give us, it's pitched at a very 
broad brush vague way really you have to fill in the gaps to make it relevant um, so we need to think about how we could do that um, and there, there's there's a number of people have, have been involved in applying this to career development and I think everyone's taking it in a slightly different direction which is absolutely fine um, I'll make some suggestions as, as to how I think we might want to, to build on this and one of the things I think we need to do is to work out what we mean by resources and factors that, that help us deploy them with, is a good starting point. So we need to, I think, rethink the person. We need a, a clear concept of, of the person for career development, as I think we're, we're sometimes a bit sketchy about this. So I'm now into adding some of my own stuff to the career development, uh, to the capability approach. So another random story. Um, I don't know why this sticks in my head, but when I was a small child, I was given um, the good enough man drawing test to do. It's a test of child development. And you, you take a child and you say, well, draw the best picture of a man you can. In those days, it was man. Uh, best picture of a man you can do. And the way you score it is the number of features, the more features there are in it of the human body, the higher the score. Now this one, okay, there's eyes, eyes and a mouth, there's no neck, there's no torso, no feet. So that, that would determine the score. And as children develop, they gradually get a more sophisticated view of what a person's body is like, or what a person is like. So a child could say, I've hurt my shoulder, and that's quite useful. But if you're a professional and you want to analyze more sophisticated problems about the body as a medical profession, you need a more sophisticated view of what the person is. Um, so in the medical profession, they have a more sophisticated view. Um, and they see a person in terms of functional systems. And then they, they, you can't separate them out from each other. They're all entangled. But for purposes of analysis, that's quite useful to have a sophisticated view of what people like. And we haven't really got that in career development. We've, we've, we've got applications of system theory, but not a structured way of modeling what a person is like. And for us, it would need to be quite abstract, because as people, we're interacting in a social environment. So I think we need something like that to give us a structure to enable us to an analyze people's resources and the factors that are helping or hindering them in their environment to deploy them. So I, I keep tinkering with this di diagram. I'm never quite satisfied with it. I think we need a model of the person that's fairly abstract. Um, and we can think about the person in many different ways. So, so my bicycle story was a story of a physical human in a physical environment. And that's one way you could analyze me. You could analyze me as a digital person in a digital environment who reluctantly and resentfully engages in, with Facebook and Twitter and all these other things that we have thrust upon us these days. So with a digital identity engaging in uh, a digital virtual world. And th so there's a variety of ways I think we could see the person and sometimes it might be useful to think about one of those in isolation. Sometimes to fully understand a person, we might need to think of all of those together. Now, this is a slightly different spin on systems thinking, but there's also a commonality here with, um, uh, how can I put it? The, uh, the capability approach is a resource-based model. It's a, it's a resources are important. But there are other resource theories knocking around in our space. And often they go have the label capitals attached to them, psychological capital or social capital or economic um, human capital. And they're all quite interesting. Actually, they're getting better. They're getting more integrated, those models. I think they're going to be quite useful to us in future but they currently don't have a sense that resources aren't enough. And it's really, you know, um, 
okay, I have some knowledge of career theory, which is a resource, but that's useless to me unless I've got an audience that's got some knowledge of that to process it. So it's the interaction between the person and their environment is where the resource becomes useful. So I think capital's approach is go some of the way towards what we need, but we need a slightly more sophisticated model of the person. So the person is, is not just my thoughts, feelings. I'm also a, a person in time and space, a social entity, a cultural entity, a learning person in a learning environment, and so on. So the person and their identity is a bit bigger and spreads out into their environment. Now, I think if we have structures like this, there's a lot you can do with it. You can analyze um, the resources people have available to them and the barriers that they face. Um, for a start, I've noticed with a lot of uh, career guidance students I teach, they're not always systematic about assessing their clients. So having a systematic assessment structure is useful. That's one thing. We're on the middle bit to do with practice, by the way. Um, the other thing where this might help practice is something else I've noticed about trainee careers advisors is they often they ask a lot of questions really quite nicely and they get a rapport going with their clients really quite nicely and then they get stuck halfway through that once they've found out about their client they've no idea what to do next because that's quite difficult and you can't move on unless you you decide how you're going to help somebody and one thing the capability approach can can do for you is it, it helps to give see what that decision might look like so you could help people by getting them to recognize the resources they've already got or you could help them to build those resources. Or you could help them to recognize the barriers and facilitators in their environment and to boost the positives and mitigate the negatives. Um, you could look at their options, try and increase their pool of options, or at least raise their awareness of the options they've already got. get them to identify what's important when we're on the choice bit and evaluate options. And of course, give people to support to implement those lifestyle choices. Now, none of that is new in our field. That's all established. That's all what careers advisors do routinely. It's just that I've noticed trainee careers advisors don't make those choices to actually do any of those things sometimes. In, uh, so being aware of those options can be useful. So some potential for, for practice there. Um, now, another practice related thing. Um, getting into the uh, professional ethics side of things. So I, I used, I don't now, but I used to for a while, I was teaching a module where we covered professional ethics. And, and I like to use this, this structure, which is um, a, a fairly generic structure for professional ethics across lots of professions. Um, and so four things that professionals should, should do. Um, and actually, we could have a bit of audience participation at this point. Uh, a question I like to ask is, for the medical profession, for doctors, if push came to shove, you had to choose only one, which one would you choose as a doctor? Above all else, do no harm. Okay? So the prime one for doctors the prime directive, ethical directive, I guess, in the Hippocratic Oath is refrain from harming or allowing harm. You know where I'm going with this. If in the career development profession we were allowed only one as our prime well, yeah, that was autonomy. Whenever I put that question to a class, class full of students, that's the answer I get is autonomy. Yeah, so support, at the end, of the push comes to shove, it's their choice, isn't it? 
Um, so there is an argument, I mean, obviously all of our ethical principles are important, but there is an argument that ultimately is quite central to what we do, and I, I want to just expand on that a little bit. Um, as you know, I'm very involved with the CDI, so I've got to point out that autonomy is in there in the CDI, professional code of ethics. So it, it's in there along with a lot of other stuff. I'm sure you've got it pinned on your wall. Um, it's not just in code of ethics, though. It's also in theory. Um, I read a chapter, a fascinating chapter by Bill Law about career theory from quite a long time ago. He's always ahead of its time. And he, he was identified autonomy as one of the key thing, key themes in career theory, and a way you could distinguish between theories, the way they handled freedom or, and, and constraints, um, or for sociologists amongst you, agency versus structure. This idea of agency just keeps cropping up in modern career theory in different forms. It's a recurring theme. So autonomy and agency are closely related. Um, and a slippery concept, perhaps, but it is closely associated with freedom. So autonomy is closely, uh, closely related to freedom. We often talk about freedom to versus freedom from. And maybe, uh, maybe the right of politics wants, <laughs> tends to favor freedom to, and the left favors freedom from, perhaps, a little bit. I've had a little look at definitions of autonomy, and it tends to be things like the right to make decisions for yourself, the capacity to make informed and uncoerced decisions. Some people say, oh, it's a little bit selfish, though, a little bit Western individualistic, isn't it? M maybe, but you could argue that autonomy, there's asp an aspect to autonomy which is also... Uh, how can I put it? Grown-ups are autonomous in a way that children are not. And grown-ups are also <laughs> take responsibility for the effect of their actions on their friends, family, and community, or at least they should do. So it doesn't necessarily involve um, a sense of selfishness, I think. It could, it could be associated with a sense of responsibility as well. A slightly different way of thinking about autonomy comes from Amartya Sen, who makes an interest, he, he associates autonomy with process freedom. So he makes a distinction between process freedom and opportunity freedom. So um, it's like how you get the freedom in the process of how you get there is just as important in a way. So autonomy is a characteristic of a good uh, decision process, but there's no guarantee you'll end up in a good place, even if you may have a good decision process. So lots of, a lot of these con concepts are entangled. Autonomy, choice, freedom, and so on. I want to say a little bit about values, not a lot. Um, in a way, a lot of career coaching, maybe particularly in the private sector, is in some form or another asking people what is important to you, what matters to you, because we'll, we'll, we can build and plan on that. And it may be in the language of the capability approach, it's, it's what kind of life do you have reason to value? Now, um, Values, I think, is an important concept for us, and I don't see enough about it, really. I'd like to see a bit more. Um, it, it, you could see it as maybe a, a psychological, as a psychologist might, as an as individual difference variable. People value different things. But it does change as we age. What's important to us is very different when we're 14, 40, or, or 80. It's, it, it does evolve. Um, I have seen a bit of research suggesting, uh, um, or a collation of research suggesting that helping people to clarify their values is associated with good outcomes from career counselling. Um, so there's some encouraging evidence in 
this isn't really an empirical talk, so I'm not going to go too far down that line. But there's some encouraging signs that values and working with people's values is a good thing for us to do. In the capability approach, that, that phrase, a life that you have reason to value, reason suggests it's a bit of a rational process. It's not an individual difference characteristics. You think through what matters to you. You maybe make trade-offs. And I think a good example of this is parents routinely trade off their comfort uh, and the number of hours they work for the needs of their children, for example. So you might value your children having a chance above life chances above yourself. And people may well make trade-offs based on that. So someone who's struggling to work more hours than they want to for the benefits of their children, well, it's, um, it's a life that they have reason to value, what the, the way that they're, they're approaching their, their choices. I won't get into it, but there is a big debate in the capability approach about how you decide how well somebody's life is going, who should make that decision, and, and some of the problems associated with that. But uh, there, there are lots of debates within the capability approach. It's not a mono, monolithic viewpoint. OK, so we've talked about ethics, um, values. Let's move on more, more towards the policy space now. Um, this, this notion of freedom um, is kind of, it is political, it's polit political and philosophical. And the, the people have been writing about what freedom means for thousands of years. And if we spoke to different politicians from different persuasions, they'd have a different view of what it meant. Picking up on one old political idea, there is a notion of a social contract between governments and citizens, um, and particularly in, maybe not in oppressive regimes, but in liberal democracies. We, we put up with quite a bit from governments, but we expect stuff in return. And one of the things we expect is freedom, freedom to worship, freedom to marry who you like as long as they're willing, um, hopefully. Um, <laughs> But there is also, uh, we also expect to be able to lead the lifestyles we want uh, uh, within reasonable pragmatic limits. Um, we see right to education in the European Charter for Human Rights. Not explicitly a right to pursue the trade of your choice, but we kind of implicitly expect, expect that that's something we should be allowed to do. Now there might be certain circumstances, like in a war where you might allow the state to curtail that freedom and allocate people to life roles or to jobs in extreme circumstances, as we might see in Ukraine at the moment, for example. But for the most part, we, we do have an implicit expectation that part one of our freedoms is freedom to pursue the trade of our choice. Um, but in practice, because of all the structural barriers, <laughs> I have to <laughs> look at you when I say structural barriers, um, because of that, it's actually very hard to translate that freedom into a reality. So one of the roles of career development services is to help people prevent governments from breaking that unspoken trade-off by making freedom in theory, freedom uh, in reality. So there is a political dimension to this. We don't tend to think of our, our, our contribution in political terms, but I think there is that. Um, I want to talk more about the economics, though. Um, there is, I, I, I want to talk a bit about the, the economic rationale for career development services. And uh, I'm, this will probably annoy some people because it's a rather superficial way of looking at things. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm talking about things in a rather... Yeah, it's a caricature of, of, of how you might view this. Um, so governments want to pursue economic growth. And unless your working population is growing, which I discovered yesterday isn't, um, you have to boost productivity. So we're doing a top-down kind of logic here. So you've got to boost productivity. How do you boost productivity? You need innovation, infrastructure, and skills, human capital. 
which the latter we're interested in. So as a government or a society, you need to invest in human capital. Okay. Uh, and there's a bit of a problem. There's a, something to worry about here. Ooh, that, you might waste that investment. What if, what if you provide loads of training and people don't turn up and don't want it? Or, or, or what if they drop out? Or what if they complete the courses and then they don't go into relevant jobs? So, so it's a wasted investment. All of which happens. So, oh no, the investment might be wasted. So, what do you need? You need career guidance services, career, career education, information, and guidance services. So, in a way, that's a simplistic way of looking at, at, at rationale. Now, I'm very grateful for that sort of rationale because it gives money to our sector. So, I'm, I'm not wanting to knock that, but I do want to suggest that it's not unproblematic, particularly at the top end there the economic growth. Um, and that's what I want to talk about now. I'm going to, actually I'm going to skip the next couple of slides in the interest of time and continuity. Um, so there's a number of reasons we might question economic growth as an overarching goal. And Amartya Sen and other big name ec economists that do have, have uh, Question this, Joseph Stiglitz, and so on. So even establishment ec economists have questioned the, the value of economic growth as a goal for society. There's a number of reasons why it's problematic. Um, first of all, you're counting stuff that you don't actually want. Somebody puts a brick through my window and I pay a glazier, that counts as economic growth. It's not good. I don't approve. Uh, and and if, you, if you care for, if, if you show some love and care for, for um, an elderly member of your family, or you, or you go for a, a health-giving walk in the woods, that doesn't count. So we're not always counting the good stuff. That's an old argument. Um, an argument that's become increasingly pertinent is that inequality has grown enormously in developed nations and many of the choices made by our governments uh, in recent years have exacerbated that problem. Why should, as a citizen, why should I care about growth if, it's not, if I'm not getting a share of it? It's going to someone else. Someone else is benefiting from that. So the, the benefits of economic growth have been captured by a small elite. Um, so that's a problem. Pro for, for many people, the biggest problem is this, that the planet cannot sustain uh, unlimited growth. Um, and there isn't time to explore the green agenda today, but that's a huge issue. Um, there is a sense in which a focus on economic growth drives individuals to be avaricious consumers and businesses to focus on profit maximization rather than having a valuable social role. Um, and finally, it tends to encourage us to value humans in terms of their macroeconomic contribution. I want to expand on that last point because I think it's relevant to our sector. I love this quote from John Ruskin, you must either make a tool of the creature or a man of him, you cannot make both. So that's a, 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 somebody writing in the middle of the Industrial Revolution, mid 19th century, about the way in which industry seems to be treating humans in an instrumental way, as a tool uh, to, as, as a means to an end, rather than an end in themselves. And some of the policy in our space, I'm thinking particularly about policies associated with welfare to work, um, labor activation, tend to be focused on, let's get this unit active so they are contributing to the macroeconomic picture, um, rather than so it's, it's a bit, and, and as I think Sen's put it, it's kind of back to front. We should be thinking, how can the economy enable this person to lead a life that's worth living? So it's, it's like back to front. Um, and Leeds, 
directly or indirectly, to, to a design of services in the, in the adult unemployment space that, that lack a, 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 some humanity, perhaps. So it is relevant to us, I think. Now, um, so we're on economics, but lots of economists are challenging the, the neoliberal consensus in economies kind of hasn't really delivered a kind of utopia to us that it promised. So there's lots of new thinking in economics, some of it going back to basics and, and uh, it, the early inspirations of the discipline and coming up with new ideas. So let's just engage with a couple of new ideas um, in economics. First of all, Kate Raworth came up with this very catchy concept of donut economics, which is focused on uh, the climate concerns, suggests that we don't want economists to be so small that they can't enable people to live, to live decent lives and have their needs met. We don't want them so big that they damage the planet. But there's a sweet spot in between, a donut-shaped sweet, sweet spot in between where we could live, and we need to steer our economies towards that space. So you could, given what I previously said, come up with an anti-growth agenda. Her position is more agnostic about growth. Growth in itself is not good, but you need to be have a, a aim for a middle road. And her work is, is in that questioning growth as, a, as an overarching goal. You see the influence of Sen. Another good example, and someone I some, who sometimes crops up on television, is Mariana Mazzucato, who also a little bit of influence, Sen influence there, her book, Mission Economy, she um, looked to the NASA Apollo program and said, this is great. It mobilized society to achieve amazing things, and nobody worried about the costs when they were doing it. It wasn't a bean-counting approach. It was let's set challenging goals for our society, and great, great things, maybe things you hadn't even imagined, will flow from that. Um, so she suggests setting challenging missions for society, and there's some resonance there with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which is a similar sort of concept in a way. So is any of this having an impact on our politics? I think maybe so. Um, most obviously, in the Labour Party, who've put out a mission-focused uh, set of objectives for society, very much mission economy. Um, so it's having a, these new economists are having a bit of influence on our politics, but let's not get carried away because there's an important counter argument here. The first mission, sustain growth. Okay, so there are reasons why they're not buying an agnostic about growth agenda, and that's probably because they need the growth to fund the public services that people expect especially in an inflationary environment. Number six, the end is nigh. Okay. Um, so let me pull it together. I, I made this grandiose title for, for um, the lecture. Let's see if we can justify it. So um, we expect political and legal liberties to, to pursue the trade of our choice the study of our choice, uh, and we hope to pursue a life that we have reasonable reason to value. So there's an individual political kind of thing going on there, which links to freedom. Oh, no, press the wrong button. Freedom links to the concept of agency in career theory, one of our key ethical principles, autonomy, it links in a way to what we're trying to achieve, the goals of our profession, to develop people's capacity to make informed and uncoerced choices. That's what we try and do, to help people understand what kind of life they would value, to help them to deploy the resources they've already got and build those resources. So freedom links very closely to what we do. It's like lurking in the background. And in a way, the offer of our profession 
to wider society, which we have to make through the medium of policymakers and funding bodies, is that we, we help people convert a theoretical freedom into a practical freedom. We help people to access the economic needs to lead a, a, a reasonably dignified life. So um, the capability approach helps us to reflect. Uh, it gets us thinking, really. What, what is our, the rationale for the services we provide? How do we fit into this 21st century new economics? Maybe it doesn't all have to be about growth. Maybe there are wider social, socially valuable aims we could contribute to. I'm going to end with... Um, Yeah, so, yeah, I should say, so there's maybe a space. Obviously, the skills agenda still matters. I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but there's a space between philosophy and politics and economics where we kind of sit in there, and there's some debates to, about how we fit in there that we've not really fully explored. I've been going on too long, so I need to end with a wee story. I've been looking for an excuse to tell this story. Um, my great niece, Phoebe, uh, that's a picture of her stealing... Uh, my thunder at my 60th birthday party um, and um, she, she went to primary school and in a, one of the reception class uh, assemblies the head teacher got all the kids to come up and say what they wanted to do when they grew up and a little boy came up and said I wanted to be an electrician and the head teacher said marvellous you can fix all the very useful you can fix all the lights in my house that's great off you go next Phoebe Phoebe went up and said, I want to be a rainbow maker. And the head teacher, OK, off you go. Um, that's, uh, and Phoebe was really upset about this. Because what the head teacher didn't get is that rainbows are important to Phoebe. And Phoebe makes rainbows. That's one of hers. And in the words of the capability approach, Phoebe has a reason to value rainbows. So I think um, one thing about the capability approach that I think, you know, is in tune with our sector is that it helps to humanize our connection with, with people's aspirations. So I need to stop there. If you want to get in touch with me, those are the contact details. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Pete. We're going to take some questions uh, uh, for, from the audience. And we've got two ways of doing that. Just to remind you, we would like to collect your questions using the Padlet. Um, and if you do that, and if we don't have time to ask Pete all the questions, um, we will ask him uh, after the lecture to put some answers together and we can get them round to everybody. But we're also really happy to take some questions by people raising their hands as well. Um, so, um, I haven't got any questions on the Padlet yet, but okay. Um, can I ask you to um, say your name, please? And, and do you want to use the microphone again? Yes, okay, that's a good idea. Would that be it? Yeah. Mark, that's Mark the Postal. Oh, I hope so, yeah. Okay. Um, so, I'm Mark Lee, I'm a Yeah. 
Yeah, that's that. I mean, it's not what happened, but I think career guidance. I mean, it is one of those professions where the process is the product. So, so try to judge in terms of what comes out at the end. How it makes the system is is impossible. It, I mean, career guidance has always struggled. And it wants evidence of impact. Something similar to the economists. Yeah. Except it would be different now. You would want additional outcomes as well. Now, the kind of uh, lives that people will live are currently unknown to today's young people. I work for yesterday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I'm visiting the sort of <laughs> well, it's it's, um, it's it, yeah, it's a great honour to have a question from you. And um, I was saying to Ken earlier, we teach our students about opportunity structures, so I, I won't argue with you. you. You won the case on their importance years ago. They're, they're absolutely crucial. But you're coming at things from quite a macro perspective, and um, that particular model was not intended as a fix for for macro allocation of resources in society. It's more about, you've got a group of people, you want to try and make their lives a little bit better, and um, work with what you've got and try and build on it. Um, it is the case, though, that, um, oh, I'm trying to give you an example to illustrate a point. Um, Sen would argue that, um, let's say you gave everybody uh, an equal right to work, but it turns out that for a disabled person to have the same job as me, they'd need extra resources. So from Sen's point of view, that isn't freedom. Um, freedom in theory is not, a legal freedom is, is not equivalent um, to freedom in practice. So it does follow from some of his arguments that you might want to target more resources on certain groups. Um, but obviously, I was trying to adapt this to a career development audience who maybe are not in a position of distributing substantial amounts of resources in society, but are trying to work with what clients come to them with. So it's in, in a way, it's just a different level of analysis in a way.
Is, is this working? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, my name's Joe. I'm a new careers lead in a special needs school. Um, one of my questions is, like many schools, us especially, we have such a wide range of students. Some will enter the labour market, um, but for some students, it's about them accessing the community successfully, not necessarily to enter full-time full work. Um, what would you see as a successful outcome of uh, young people who don't necessarily enter work? And one of my interests is how to argue that success to senior leaders and, and the community. Yeah, no, so you're trying to pin me down on the bit I was trying to gloss over intentionally there. So, um, yeah, so who decides what a good outcome looks like is, um, well, you could say it's up to the individual. And if you had a, an autonomous adult then um, who uh, was reasonably capable, then, then that might be fair enough. Um, in the case of, you know, maybe somebody with a learning disability, it, you know, maybe that is going to be forced to be a collective decision between that per person, parents, other professionals, and so on. Um, so there is a debate there about who gets to decide what a good outcome looks like. And it might not be the same answer for everybody. In some of these international development situations, they suggest having some sort of democratic process in a village or something to work out what a good, good outcome would look like. But that is, I think, one of the tricky bits. In, in, you put your finger on, on a, a tricky area here. What does a good outcome look like? And it might not be the same for everyone in every situation. Okay, th thank you, Pete. We've got uh, some questions on the Padlet now as well. So um, uh, this question, does Pete think there should be other inputs into how careers advisors could be trained in the future in supporting their professional development? Other inputs, what do you mean? I'm, I'm not sure what they mean by that. Um, other new theories or new concepts, Does that, do you think that's the drift of it? Um, I'm clearly interested in, in having a flow of ideas into our, into our sector. So I, I hope that will continue. I think a challenge for new people to the sector is, is that, that there is now a cluttered landscape of ideas and it's not always clear what to focus on and many of these ideas are fascinating but they're not all useful um, in practice so I think that is a is a dilemma and it and it may be that people like me as educators of careers advisors could do a better job at, at pruning the uh, the the, um, the the bush so that that people get a more useful set of um, concepts to play with. Okay, thank you. Another question, this was on inequality. Um, the question is, by starting with resources and capabilities, doesn't send work risk making individuals overly responsible and isn't it overly individualistic? Okay. Um, I was kind of hoping it was the antidote to that. Um, so I don't see it that way. Um, th I guess in, in a profession where very often we work with individuals, a lot of the approaches we use could be labeled as individualistic. Um, but I think that's probably more true of psychological approaches than it probably is of concepts that are at least a bit socio-economically, politically aware like this one. Um, so that's definitely a problem in our sector. I'm probably not going to accept it's an entirely fair critique of, of at least not of the intention of, of this approach. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's that's <laughs> that's a, so so 
Yes, you're drilling down into my rhetorical ploy there. To, uh, yeah, fair point. Um, I think... Um, OK, so when... Let me... I have to relate this to the way that I previously taught students about ethics. There's a difference between ethical problem and an ethical dilemma. Um, an, an ethical problem is you can get out your code of ethics and then you can see there's a clear answer to it. An ethical dilemma is you're caught whichever way, you know, that, this principle says go that way, the other principle says go the other way. Okay, so if you've got an ethical dilemma, um, you then have to privilege one principle over another. So my question was, which principle would you privilege over the others? It doesn't mean the others don't matter. They're all right up there and mattering. It's, it's just if you had a forced choice, where would you go?